How do you think environmental science is changing and how will it change in the future? Should we expect changes in who is engaging with environmental science and the ways that they're doing so? What can we do to maximize our chance at a positive future in the context of these changes? In a moment, we'll be handing over to our expert panel of speakers to set the scene for us. I'll give them a quick introduction now, but as we call them up to speak, I'll also give you a little more information about their background and some of their credentials. So first, we're going to hear from Gary Cass, who is the Principal Specialist in Strategic Science at Natural England, as well as an IES Vice President. Gary has a strong background in foresight, specifically on environmental science and what that means, and he'll be sharing insights informed by that background in a moment. After Gary, our next speaker will be Naomi Holmes, the Associate Professor of Geography and Environmental Education at Sheffield Hallam University. Naomi is also a member of the Committee, the Community for Environmental Disciplines in Higher Education, SEED, um, and will be speaking to us about the future of environmental science and education and exactly what environmental science education means as well. And then the final speaker opening today's event will be John Tallon, Professor of Hydrogeology at the University of Birmingham. John has over 40 years of research and teaching experience, particularly on hydrogeology, groundwater science and engineering. So he'll give us a lens into a single topic on the future of environmental science, looking at groundwater and some of the implications of that topic. After the presentations, we'll pop into breakout discussions where everyone will have a chance to share their views on the future of the environmental sciences, to discuss what the speakers have said and engage in horizon scanning into the future of environmental science. Once those discussions are completed, there will be the chance to ask your questions to the panel. So please do submit those in the chat box on your screen as soon as we're back from the breakout discussions so that we still have them in the chat box. And then we'll put your questions to the panelists directly. If you have more general comments, feel free to also add those to the chat box throughout. But while we're uh, having speakers talking, please can we also make sure everybody's muted so that we can hear what the speakers are saying. Hopefully that all makes sense and thank you for logging in. Um, but I'm now going to hand it over to our panel of speakers, starting with Gary. Gary Cass is an environmental and sustainability science and knowledge broker with over 35 years practice working at the interface of science and policy. Gary joined the public sector in 1995 as head of the Environment and Energy Programme at the Parliamentary Office Science and Technology, and he became head of public engagement with science and technology within the UK government. Gary joined Natural England in 2007, served as Deputy Chief Scientist between 2014 and 2022, and is now Principal Specialist in Strategic Science. Gary's roots in academia include serving on NERC's uh, Innovation Advisory Board and the Research Excellent Framework, where he was a member of the Geography and Environmental Studies sub-panel in 2014 and 2021, with a particular focus on impact and policy relevance. Gary is a visiting professor at the Center for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Surrey and held a fellowship at the University of Cambridge Center for Science and Policy. Gary, over to you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I almost didn't recognize myself then. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna speak for uh, a few minutes. Um, I could speak for hours about this and I probably have done already uh, over the years. Um, and I'm gonna ask uh, what I think are a number of kind of provocative kinds of questions. And I'm going to start really with this idea that uh, we've spent a lot of time in environmental science worrying about environmental diagnosis and when it's time to move to environmental cure. And that metaphor is something I took from Duncan Wingham, who is the chief executive of the Natural Environment Research Council. Um, and some of the difficulties that he, as the chief executive of that council, is, is facing in, in trying to make that shift. But essentially, I think what we're all trying to do in environmental science is is kind of un understand these uh, six questions. So how is the environment uh, and people's interactions with it changing and why? So what are the drivers of change, the pressures that they bring up and how does that lead to a, to a change in the state of the environment? Um, does the change actually matter? Because you know change happens all the time. It doesn't all automatically trigger uh, some kind of reaction. So we need to understand whether the change matters and if so, to whom and in what ways really whether we should do something about it. We need to understand impact and significance and the values that underpin those kinds of judgments. Uh, if we did decide to do something about it, what could we do about it? And how would we choose the best options? So what kind of options are available to us? How do we kind of stimulate innovation to develop options if, we, if there aren't any? And then how do we go about appraising and decision-making around those options? Um, having chosen some options, uh, what do we do to actually make them uh, you know, practical to, to apply and how do we actually design and implement um, the, the application of these options and make them work in the real world. 
And then, of course, we have to ask that question, do the interventions actually work? And if so, why do they work? And if not, why, why not? Uh, there's so questions about evaluation and learning kind of come into that. And of course, there's issues about what do we mean by work and work for whom and where and all that kind of other stuff. And then fundamentally, because we are trying to uh, affect the, or some, some uh, shift in the way that humans have been interacting with the planet, we kind of do need to scale up and, and roll out these interventions. And how do we do that? So can we learn lessons from the development, diffusion and deployment of other innovations? So those are the kind of core questions I wanted to ask, but I also wanted to uh, move us on to thinking about the context in which we're trying to operate this. Um, and we really are trying to integrate across social and natural systems. So I kind of presented here uh, a, dis you know, a, a graphic that kind of underpins this notion of the socio-ecological system. Um, and I think environmental sciences has been very good at the right-hand side of this diagram, understanding natural systems and the systems, processes and dynamics and outcomes. We've been less good over the years at understanding the social systems, uh, governance, production, consumption, et cetera, that, uh, you know, that, that kind of create the effects and pressures on, on those natural systems. And the sense really is that we kind of need to understand all of this uh, in, in a much more kind of a holistic way. And one of the IES's kind of founding principles really is about us taking a much more systems view to, to doing that. So my provocation is that we, looking to the future, we need to be much more focused on integrated social and natural systems. Um, and that these kind of work in the understanding the kind of key drivers of change uh, across the social, technological, environmental, economic and political uh, space. And that we really kind of need to look at these across different spatial scales, but also temporal scales, because change plays out differently and different values to play in, uh, in different places. Um, so this kind of helps us to think really about where the future of environmental sciences might, go, might, might be going. And I refer back to a conversation that Joseph convened for a, a few uh, fellows and vice presidents of the IES last week, in which I kind of suggested a possible reframing. Um, the IES itself has, has uh, defined and redefined environmental science over the years. We last did it back in 2017. And I'm just wondering whether the time is, is right for at least a conversation about whether it's time to reframe it again now. So over the last sort of 10 or so years, this, this kind of field has, has emerged called sustainability science. Um, and it, in many ways, it's akin to medical science because it's, it's defined by the problems it addresses rather than the disciplines it employs. Uh, and it serves the need for advancing knowledge and action by creating dynamic bridges between, the, between knowledge and action and it's really just a convenient term for how the research community is, is contributing to the wonderful phrase from Amartya Sen, informed agitation required to address the challenges of sustainable development. And I think this is, this is where perhaps things start to get a bit uh, uh, slightly, slightly tricky. This notion of science as agitation or as informed agitation in particular, because fundamentally what we are trying to do is an entirely political with a small p kind of project, which is about shifting the way that people have done things in the past to you know, new and better ways in the future. And there are vested interests involved in that and therefore there are gonna be political contentions. And we see this all the time. We saw that uh, you know, within international um, agreements and we see it locally as well. Um, but fundamentally, I think what we're, what we're facing really is, is this possibility of, of a reframing. And it kind of leaves us really with, with three questions in the end. Uh, which I quite like to kind of uh, summarize really this overarching question, are we actually sustainability scientists now? Um, and should, should uh, IES redefine uh, environmental sciences again? Should it rebrand itself uh, entirely? And there's two possible options for how we might do this that we, that we tested uh, briefly uh, on, on Friday. Uh, might we become the institution for sustainability science or indeed the institution of environmental and sustainability science if we wanted to keep the environmental bit in there. So by way of provocation, I hope that's been uh, suitably provocative. Um, I can always ramp up the provocation, that's not a problem <laughs> for me. Um, so hopefully Joseph, that's that's enough and I will stop sharing now, thank you. Uh, that's wonderful, thank you Gary. Uh, what was a great presentation and I think a really interesting, almost philosophical interrogation of uh, where we are as environmental scientists and where we could see ourselves in the future.
that that holistic systems view is definitely something we need to see increasingly. Um, and to that that question about the label of environmental or sustainability science, it was definitely a controversial question at uh, the last time uh, we spoke. So hopefully, like you say, it's an interesting provocation for today's discussion as well. Um, as we continue, our next speaker is Naomi Holmes. Uh, Naomi is currently Associate Professor of Geography and Environmental Education at Sheffield Hallam University, uh, where she teaches into environmental science and geography undergraduate courses. Uh, her research focuses on pedagogies in geography and environmental higher education, outdoor learning, accessibility of science and environmental change. As well as being an academic, Naomi is an outdoor learning practitioner and has successfully integrated applied outdoor learning opportunities into her teaching. So Naomi, uh, over to you. Hi everyone. So hopefully you can um, see my screen and hear me. <laughs> That's always the first thing. So um, the talk by Gary actually sets this, this talk up really nicely in terms of thinking about where our subject is going um, in terms of the education side of things. So I'd just like to firstly thank you for the opportunity to speak today, but also I'd like to provide my thanks to the wider environmental science and geography higher education communities because lots of the work that I'm talking about over the next um, short while is work that's come from the wider community, not just from myself. So I want to start by sort of thinking about what do we mean by environmental science education? And I am going to be focusing on higher education today, really. And when we think about environmental science education, it's likely that we're all thinking about different things, depending on our own experiences or those of people that we know. We know that environmental science is an incredibly diverse subject, and we've just heard that we might need to start thinking about changing our definitions of um, environmental science. And, and as a result, so is environmental science education. And depending on where, by who, and how environmental science is taught, the content can vary really considerably. But in most cases, the five bullet points on this slide are likely to play a part within the education. It's also useful for us to think about the purpose of an environmental science education when we do this, um, maybe to enable students to become the future leaders of change. So to enable them to identify, understand and mitigate environmental challenges, valuing different approaches and points of view, sharing scientific knowledge with wider society, developing professional skills, thinking critically and to focus on solutions which can help us to address the global sustainability issues. There's been a lot of conversation both within IES and also globally about the importance of environmental and environmental science education, particularly in relation to the climate and biodiversity crises. And I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, there's also been much discussion around different elements of environmental education. And I'd refer those of you interested in this to read the November 2020 issue of Environmental Scientists, which really focuses on the value of an environmental science education. It considers opportunities for environmental education, thinks about the value of widespread environmental literacy in addressing global sustainability issues. And the bullet point list on this slide provides a really simplified list of topics that this issue of the environmental scientist focuses on. We've already had mention about what sits within environmental science and, and Gary sort of talking about the different elements within environmental science and, and where we might be going with this. And this slide shows a word cloud generated from a really brief search on the UCAS website, looking for undergraduate courses in or related to environmental science. The size of the words on the screen doesn't re um, represent the number of courses offered um, across the country. It represents the number of times that word is used in a discrete course title. So environmental was coming up in, in the majority of the course titles, followed closely by sustainability, and then seeing words like management, science, earth, um, climate and change within there. So we can see that there's a really broad range of degree programs. And again, this really reflects the diversity of our subject and the types of things that applicants are going to be seeing when they're looking for courses within our area. There are a number of new and modified programs available. Some, some of these coming through um, in the last couple of years and, and some still being validated, many of which are not called environmental science. So we need to be aware that our subject is, is sort of much broader and, and our applicants and our environmental scientists of the future are, are going to be looking for these different words. So given the diversity of environmental science education, I wanted to focus the rest of the talk on some of the issues and thoughts which are relevant for environmental science education across HE, no matter the actual specifics of the course. 
So if we think about some of the challenges that are currently impacting environmental science education with, with that focus on, on higher education, um, we sort of think about the fact that environmental science isn't a distinct subject pre-A level. There's some challenges around the visibility of employment opportunities and seeing where a degree in environmental sciences might take us, thinking around um, sort of the pay, pay that we receive in employment as well. These might or might not contribute to the fact that we often have small numbers of students studying environmental science courses. We have significant costs um, within our courses around sort of those out of the classroom learning experiences, such as um, laboratory and field work, which are in my view, really super important and which we want to be continuing with our students. And we also have um, a challenge around the diversity of people studying environmental science at the moment. And that's one which I'm going to discuss um, further here. And I think that that should be one of our, our kind of key priorities for environmental science education going forwards. We know that the UK environmental sector isn't diverse. Um, this slide contains quotes from report by the Natural Environment Research Council at the top, that UK environmental sciences are not as diverse as we would wish them to be. And also a quote from the IES report um, on a challenging environment, the experiences of ethnic minority environmental professionals. And this bottom quote is really important, um, that a more diverse workforce can provide an array of backgrounds and experiences to help generate the ideas, outputs and solutions that the environment sector needs to tackle the interlinking environmental crises we are facing. So it's really important that as we think about the environmental science education of the future, we think about being able to educate as diverse a range of students to lead into our environmental workforce within the future. So who works in the environment professions? Um, this is taken from a report, Racial Diversity in Environment Professions 2022 by a group called Students Organizing for Sustainability. And the data here illustrate the point that I just um, mentioned. We can see that only 4.81% of environmental professions identified as black, Asian, or from other minority ethnic groups within this report. And when we look at the data about who studies environmental science at university, this slide, which was put together by my colleague, who's the course leader of environmental science at Sheffield Hallam, shows us that from the 2020 to 2021 HESA data, the percentage of students studying both undergraduate and postgraduate level environmental science was much lower than that in other areas. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but we can see the total student population on this second set of bar charts total science in this one here and then environmental science I've highlighted here so we can see that we've got a real reduction in the percentages of black Asian or minority ethnic students studying environmental science. There's several reasons for this and environmental science education as a whole needs to work within and across institutions to start removing barriers and broadening participation and talking about the barriers um, could be a whole couple of hours in itself. So I'm going to kind of move on to thinking about some of the, briefly some of the things we can do going forwards. So how can we start to create a kind of more diverse future for our, our environmental science education? There's recently been a number of, of, sort of studies and pieces of work undertaken within our community that have focused on increasing diversity within environmental science, including several projects that were funded by NERC over the last couple of years. Many of these projects focused on the removal of particular barriers and on broadening participation. Projects focused on different stages of an individual's journey, for example, pre-university, during the university experience, post-university and going out into the workplace. There's a huge amount of good work going on at different institutions, and there's been much good practice developed, which we need to ensure is shared across our environmental science education community. And I'm just going to briefly mention two areas going forwards. But as we can see from the, the sort of illustration on the slide that came out of a project I worked on with geographers and environmental scientists and the bullet points which have come from work in the wider community, there's a lot going on within our community that we need to share and start to sort of take broader. So with the lack of diversity in the environmental workforce, it can be really hard for people to have role models who look like them. This chart comes from the IES 2022 report, A Challenging Environment. And we can see that the majority of ethnic minority professionals strongly disagreed, so the light gray, 
or disagreed that they found it easy to have role models who look like them within their organisation. And we know that this can also be a challenge for students who are studying environmental science. Recently at Sheffield Hallam, my colleague Dr Nabila Ahmed organised a minoritised student group. At the launch event, we had three successful professionals come into the university to talk to students about their university and career journeys. And all of them spoke within their, um, their introductions to their careers about the challenges of being a student who could not see people who look like themselves in their chosen profession, within their teaching staff, or as other students studying in their courses. And it's hoped that this particular group will provide a space for students of colour, for community, for activities and discussions to help solve challenges and share experiences and opportunities. So this isn't happening within the curriculum, this is happening extra to the curricular activity. We also know that there are challenges associated with specific elements of our courses, such as fieldwork. This image here is a um, illustration from a focus group with um, geographers and environmental scientists, uh, mostly staff, discussing how we can try to make fieldwork more accessible and inclusive. There's been much progress in this particular area, but there's still a huge amount of work to be done across our sector, across our courses, um, to ensure that we're able to um, make our courses accessible, and inclusive, and that all can take part in them. And work like this needs to be carried out at the same time as we consider the sustainability of our learning provision. We also need to think about other routes into the environmental science sciences, um, becoming an environmental scientist. I focused really around the sort of the, the more standard um, undergraduate degree in the previous slides, but we need to consider routes such as the environmental practitioner degree apprenticeship, which offers a much more vocational route into the environmental sciences allied with study um, within and within the workplace as well. So we need to be sort of considering these different options when we're thinking about how we um, broaden participation within the environmental sciences. I also want to bring in the student voice to this. And um, we don't just want to listen to my opinion and, and the opinion of other academics working in environmental science. What is it that students want from an environmental science education? And there's a list on the screen and you'll see that some of these points overlap with what I've just discussed. So thinking about having field courses and field work opportunity, but particularly EDI came across strongly. They want their course to be accessible to all students and they want to see equity and diversity within their course, within the staff teaching them and within the careers that they're going into. They're also keen to study environmental science because of the broad choice of topics um, and the opportunity for that practical hands-on learning experience. They were all really keen that their course enables real world experience through placements, internships, industrial experience, through assessments that are carried out in relation with employers. And so there's, there's that kind of real opportunity for the community of environmental scientists, both those in the workplace, the IES, other organizations, and within environmental science education to be working together to kind of really promote this um, sort of more diverse community of environmental scientists and to support that as we go forward. And then finally, the sort of topic that I would just want to cover briefly is thinking, and again, this allies to, to what Gary talked about earlier, thinking about, we need to think about where environmental science education sits. There's a wide range of degree courses, both undergraduate and postgraduate that offer an environmental science education. As we focus on a wide range of global sustainability challenges, including the climate and biodiversity crisis we, we're hearing about much, much more now, should we start to ensure that elements of an environmental science education are available more widely to more students across different subjects, with environmental scientists leading on this more interdisciplinary form of education? We have a focus on education for sustainable development within different subjects, but we're also starting to see the development of cross-university elective modules which contain elements of environmental science education. And seeing these at undergraduate level may then allow more people um, from a diverse range of backgrounds, diverse range of subjects, different knowledges, different voices, to maybe come into environmental science at that postgraduate level. So one example is at Sheffield Hallam, my colleague um, B. Gan has um, for the last couple of years led an interdisciplinary online international learning experience, which is now being going through validation to become a second year level five um, optional module available across the university, working with students in different countries 
and teaching as it says here it's an online international learning experience so they'll be sort of teaching between different institutions university of york has interdisciplinary modules um they sit within their environmental sustainability at york area these include modules we can see here future of food climate crisis action lab sustainability and policy and sustainability clinic so starting to get some of our sort of more environmental science subjects out to a wider range of students and allowing more people to contribute to the, the challenge going forward into the solutions. And just to finish up, um, really important for us to sort of take, take this point, and this comes from that value of environmental science education um, from November 2020, the IES um, magazine. Environmental education is fundamental to achieving humanity's transformative challenge. That was in the editorial to that. And I just sort of wanted to end up by saying, you know, we want to make sure as many people as possible are able to access it so that going forwards, we can be sort of really leading on those solutions. So thank you very much for your time listening to me today. Uh, I hope that was interesting. I look forward to some discussions around that later on. Thank you, Naomi. I think it was definitely interesting from my perspective. I think uh, as a whole, it was it was a great presentation. I think you really you made a really strong case for the importance of environmental science and education, and in that context, the challenges, the opportunities for the future of this area of education. Um, particularly on uh, that question of of diversity and inclusion, I think you make an excellent point about where we are now, and it really shows how much further. Uh, we need to go as we think about the future of environmental science and, and ed education as a, a gateway to the sciences. Um, and it was it was good to hear that the students had had that perspective as well. Um, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about some of those barriers that you mentioned in the breakout discussion in the Q&A when we get there. Uh, but first, I think uh, we'd be remiss not to bring in the technical element of this conversation about the future as well. And uh, to that end, our final panelist is going to be John Tallon. Uh, John Tallon is Professor of Hydrogeology at the University of Birmingham. He has over 40 years of research and teaching experience and for many years has run the university's MSc course in hydrogeology, uh, groundwater science and uh, engineering. His uh, research interests have included the relationships between regional groundwater chemistry and groundwater flow, wetland systems, urban groundwater, and inorganic surface interacting solute and nanoparticle movement in sandstone sequences. He supervised around 50 research students and served on various advisory committees, including for UNESCO, the Geological Society of London, the UK Groundwater Forum, and recently UK GEOS the UK's Geoenergy Observatories program. So John, over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, a nutritional content warning. Um, I'm not a, uh, a, a horizon scanning professional or a practitioner. Uh, and what I say today is is really sort of cobbled together um, in a fairly short time, and it, it seemed that there was so much to cover. And anyway, so my apologies to, to start off with. I'm going to define groundwater as any water below the ground surface. At any one time, it comprises about 99% of the Earth's liquid fresh water. And as a result, it's a major arc of the hydrological cycle. That's often sort of forgotten by the general public, um, it seems. Uh, if the UN report from last year looking at the state of groundwater globally is anything to go by because its uh, subtitle is Making the Invisible Visible. Groundwater supplies about 25% of all fresh water used in the globe uh, and indirectly supplies much of the surface water used as well in, in certain sorts of environment. Apart from its huge volume, uh, it is characterized very often by a sort of slow, damped response, uh, both in terms of water flows and in terms of chemical movement. So it has a certain buffering capacity. Of course, it has lots of commonalities with surface water, um, but there are some major contrasts too. Whatever we do, though, we must consider them all as part of one system. So coming back a little bit to what Gary was saying. I sort of mentioned uh, water resources, and clearly groundwater is important for water resources and the other side of that, uh, contamination, but it also be, uh, is very important for a number of other areas um, uh, of uh, uh, applied uh, work. So that includes geology, so looking at the cementing of rocks, looking at the 
fracturing and folding of rocks, looking at ice movement in civil engineering from uh, for drainage, uh, both surface and subsurface, uh, looking at things like uh, foundations and stability of slopes. It's important for uh, geoenergy, for carbon sequestration, ecosystem support, waste disposal design, things like nuclear waste disposal, um, uh, looking at geological storage, for example, mineralization and mining, geological hazards, things like landslides, uh, um, uh, quicksand, subsidence in petroleum, and it even gets out into the cultural world um, in one way or the other. In terms of um, its sort of application, it's concerned really with data collection, interpretation and prediction, as most things are, and then subsequently with groundwater system um, modifications, interventions. It's problem solving at heart, uh, generally speaking, and at scales from engineering site all the way up to national. Um, the basic approach is similar to many uh, areas in environmental science and beyond. So there's a data collection observation period, there's a development of conceptualization, there's a conversion of that into a quantitative model, and it's usually process based rather than statistical. Um, using the model then to design field interventions, uh, and then applying field intervention, and then uh, as a result of that, collecting more information, more uh, uh, data about the site, and as a result, the conceptual model then gets modified and so on and so on. So the usual sort of iterative uh, uh, procedure um, develops a suck it and see type approach. There are many uh, questions that uh, are out there yet unanswered within groundwater science and engineering. Some of the sort of bigger scale ones might be to do with spatial heterogeneity, temporal heterogeneity, quantifying the limits of knowable uh, representation, oh, oh sorry, knowable um, areas within hydrogeology, representation of mixing, a range of others, and then lots of specific things down to looking at things like redox reaction coupling, uh, predicting bacterial processes and so on. Those are the sort of science ones, but coming back uh, to um, the previous uh, talks, uh, that of course has got to be linked in with management uh, questions as well and um, sociological end of things. And indeed, also with technology questions, looking at the technologies available to apply to different problems. So what about the future? Well, what I've tried to do is to tackle it via thinking about drivers of groundwater science. And one of the major drivers of groundwater science, a very much applied science, is um, practical concerns. So existing concerns, uh, things like increase in, in demand for water, uh, climate change, water security, but also another driver is advances in technology, of course, and simply curiosity. And of course, all of this is tempered by the availability of finance. Now, I can't put all of that all together with all of the things up on the top right hand side. So what I've decided to do is to pick out water resources and contamination, a little bit about geoenergy and a little bit about technological metals. Being an optimist, I'm going to assume green world rather than fortress world for the future. And I'm going to be taking examples rather than uh, giving you anything well worked out in terms of data analysis. Um, so some groundwater resource concerns. Uh, we've seen the picture on the top right hand side uh, already from uh, Naomi uh, looking at the UN Sust uh, Sustainable Development Goals. There's a lot of issues in uh, groundwater well, related to groundwater across the world that have yet to be sorted out. And really, the 17 goals from the sustainable development, at least 14 of those have got a significant groundwater uh, input into them. And they summarise really a lot of the sort of aims that people have been working towards uh, via uh, doing research and development. One of the big issues, of course, is recharge. Recharge is the amount of water that goes into uh, the groundwater system uh, and therefore dictates the total amount of flow that's in the system that's available. So as demand for water goes up, 
then of course what will happen is that we want to maximize recharge and so there's been quite a lot of work done on managed aquifer recharge through boreholes or um, basins and a range of other different ways. Land use, land cover makes a good deal of difference to how much water gets in, so that has to be managed. Um, and of course, climate change will cause changes in recharge, not necessarily downwards, um, but uh, not necessarily upwards either. Can be both uh, at the same location at different times, as has been recently forecast by the British Geological Survey for the UK. Um, but one of the really big uncertainties within this, of course, are, climate, uh, are, are global climate models, uh, because quite a lot of recharge is uh, affected strongly by things that are not predicted well by global climate models, even if you get around the downscaling issues. We've been looking at other sources of groundwater, and I've listed uh, a, a few over here been considering the possibility of tipping points. Uh, hear quite a lot about tipping points in terms of climate. Well, potentially there are tipping points in terms of uh, groundwater surface water systems. So for example, here we might have groundwater supplying a, a stream. And then if we abstract too much or the recharge changes through climate change and the water level falls, we get water discharging from the stream and maybe even the stream drying up. So are there tipping points uh, like this, which are sort of universal? People have also looked in a connected way there uh, with extremes. So extremes of droughts and floods, what causes them and what types of fl floods and droughts are there? there? Um, surface water droughts versus groundwater droughts and so on. One of the great advantages, uh, as I mentioned earlier, of groundwater system is that it's um, a rather slow, long wavelength type uh, system. And as a result, it has a fairly large buffering capacity, which may help us, and people have been investigating this, may help us over short term fluctuations, droughts, um, and over longer term ones. In terms of contamination, well, again, contamination comes into the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Um, as recharge changes, it will change the groundwater chemistry through systems as pathways change and sources of recharge change. As uh, the populations develop, we'll end up with more food requirements, so that will require more agrochemicals going into the system. The groundwater temperature will change and that will have an effect on groundwater quality. Uh, there's lots of emerging contaminants. So we hear quite a lot about the forever chemicals, the PFAS, the uh, polyfluoroalkyl substances, uh, which are being found everywhere uh, nowadays. And that includes in groundwaters, but also things like cosmetics and pharmaceuticals and nanoparticles being found in groundwater systems as well and their impacts on indigenous bacteria. Um, quite a lot of work goes on looking at uh, microbes, but we're a long way away from looking at uh, or understanding uh, what goes on in detail with uh, microbial actions. They're very important in terms of breaking down many of the synthetic organics that find their way into groundwater systems. But now we're also finding antibiotic resistant bacteria within the groundwater system. Lots of work going on in uh, designing waste disposal facilities, including bioengineering, and in terms of, again, of using aquifer buffering capacity as a sort of resilience buffer for chemistry as well as for flows. Sea level rise, well, abs great abstraction of groundwater has partly contributed to sea level rise, not just melting. Um, and uh, there's also a great threat clearly with things uh, or locations like um, these Pacific islands here where with rising ground, uh, rising sea levels, uh, getting things like overtopping and uh, damaging the freshwater lenses that the communities entirely rely on for their water supply lying on top of the seawater uh, in the rock underneath. In terms of groundwater related geoenergy, concerns. Uh, in order to hit the carbon um, targets, then we'll almost certainly have to have a great rollout of uh, ground source heating and cooling uh, going on in uh, uh, in the UK and many other countries. 
that's going to result in competition with uh, supply boreholes and with other ground source heat uh, systems. It's going to change the temperature of the shallow subsurface and it's going to have major flushing um, events within the shallow subsurface. And we're not quite sure what that will do, for example, to bacterial communities that are so important in cleaning up groundwater systems. Nuclear waste disposal needs sorting out uh, in many countries, including uh, the UK, of course, and that is very often uh, going to have to be a geological disposal route, and groundwater comes into that centrally. Geothermal energy production, fracking, energy storage, compressed air, um, hydrogen reservoir development, carbon sequestration, again, it's injecting fluids into the subsurface, into deep saline aquifers, for example, and seeing what uh, the um, uh, or uh, uh, making sure that the carbon is then uh, stored forever. In terms of technology metals, well, technology metals uh, are probably well aware of things like uh, required for uh, relatively newer technologies of things like mobile phones and so on. So includes lithium and tin and tungsten and so on. Um, there are concerns with supplies for this. Uh, they're rather limited in uh, in terms of wars, but also thinking about political uh, security. So uh, there have been there has been quite a lot of discussion and uh, attempts at developing brine sources for uh, recovering these metals. So, for example, this is Cornish Lithium's system down in Cornwall that they're developing for deep fractured uh, rock near the uh, granite intrusions. And other people have uh, advocated the use of developing the water flow systems immediately above young volcanoes. I'm not quite sure how, well, I'm not sure about politically secure, but the security from other points of view is clearly in, in question there. So those are the sort of practical problems which are driving the subject area. But of course, um, technological advances also drive uh, drive the subject. Uh, and I've sort of headed these up, tools for data collection and collation, tools for interpretation and prediction, and tools for manipulation of the groundwater system. So coming back to the sort of way that many groundwater projects are set up. So sensors, lots of chemical and physical sensors, use of AI, Internet of Things, looking at omics, um, biochemistry indicators, um, technology transfer from uh, the oil industry, for example, uh, satellite uh, geophysics, uh, drilling uh, technology, and very important data collation um, systems so that we can address the really disparate set of information that's required in order to manage groundwater systems. Tools for interpretation and prediction, well, ever greater computing power is always very useful, big data and community science. Modeling approaches, we heard earlier about the linking up of the uh, different areas. So hydrosociology is, is a well-recognized area now within um, the, the, uh, the, the disciplines. And so using of that, using of artificial intelligence for interpreting um, uh, modeling tools, or at least first pass modeling tools, and then development of wastewater treatment systems, um, uh, for example, treatment of, of PFAS. And then finally, tools for manipulation of groundwater systems. Well, hopefully, um, AI assisted uh, manipulations uh, of uh, uh, and looking at new remediation technologies, for example, those using nano uh, materials. Curiosity, well, it can be almost anything. And I sort of link back to the science questions on the earlier slide here and lots of fundamental sort of areas. And I won't uh, um, go through those in detail. So to finish off, um, a sort of a far future vision uh, look into where things might be going or might not be going. I don't know. Um, Context, again, thinking about green world as opposed to fortress world. It's fortress world. Well, I'll give up, really. But anyway, green world. Uh, imagining that there'll be a circular economy, green growth, maybe, maybe not. Um, and again, thinking about data collection, data interpretation and groundwater system manipulation. 
So data collection, much more powerful and uh, much more intensive monitoring. That's the only way that we're going to really advance with some of these things. So sensors of lots of different parameters across the board. So not just parameters to do with chemistry or physics of the system, but also do ideally with the, you know, looking into the more social ends of, of, of things as well, for example, and certainly the biological end of things. Internet of Things, um, artificial intelligence control, um, data interpretation, multi-phase uh, modeling, not just looking at groundwater flow and chemistry, but linking in everything else. Um, and again, uh, probably artificial intelligence assisted interpretation, at least first pass interpretation of the results. Groundwater system manipulation, real time updating of uh, models, AI assisted interpretation, joint optimization with a whole range of different types of things. So not just groundwater, but surface water, atmosphere, um, carbon emissions, energy, food production and so on. Um, and some degree of automated remediation or automated change to abstraction regimes, for example, manipulation of different types of water resources within a particular um, uh, catchment area. Now, all of that requires a great deal of work in terms of uh, regulation and management, and those are very significant areas of development and research in their own right, and legal, of course. Um, all of that uh, is sort of outside my normal realm, so I've not concentrated on that. Whatever we do, whether this is uh, realistic or overblown or too far in the future, I don't know. But whatever we have to do, we have to be proactive in recognizing problems. We used to be very reactive. We're now starting to be a little bit more proactive, but you really need to step that up. A lot of what I've said there is very technology heavy, and it certainly needs a very secure manual override to the whole thing. And the final thing, coming back uh, to uh, touching on what Naomi was talking about, uh, at the moment, we haven't got anywhere near enough professionals. The industry is absolutely crying out for professionals in groundwater. We can't get enough students. We do need, as she was saying, to be able to bring or up the knowledge from uh, people doing other sorts of disciplines, maths or physics or whatever, the uh, sociology to be able to be much more aware of the issues that we need them for in order that we're going to solve these major problems that are, uh, are faced uh, uh, globally. So sorry it was so quick, but thank you very much for your time. Well, no, thank you, John. It was a fascinating presentation. Uh, you started by saying there was so much to cover, and I think you've certainly met the challenge of covering an awful lot of it in a, a very small amount of time. Uh, you've certainly you've given us a lot to think about as we consider how the developments in, in groundwater may apply to each of our own specialisms as well. Um, and in particular, I think taking that drivers and tipping points uh, perspective is, is really helpful and, and actually maybe opens the door to thinking about some of the issues that Gary was talking about at the beginning. Thank you all for, uh, for having those discussions. Uh, we're going to hear a quick brief summary from each of the groups about what was uh, discussed. Uh, so from uh, my group, I'll give a very quick uh, summary. I think broadly speaking, we covered about seven different issues across the topic of the group. The first is about the integration of environmental science in the future. And that's both on the level of integrating what we might call hard sciences with um, social sciences, softer sciences, other disciplines, but also integrating them with the policy element of solutions that come alongside the identification of data and environmental challenges. Um, and that this is not only something which we probably are moving towards, but is something that we ought to be moving towards in the future as well. The second theme, and it comes along with that, is uh, the theme about communication. It's about the, once we already know uh, what a lot of the issues are or how they manifest, how we can then take those on to communicating it to a wider audience in the public. And we've talked a lot about brokers in the group and who can sit between the science and the public, who can engage a wide and diverse set of audiences for those kinds of conversations. And then the third was perhaps a subset of this theme about the image and vision of sustainability we can create in the future, a positive vision for the kind of world that we want to live in, which is probably important to that narrative message and the role that organizations like the IPCC have historically played in that, that will eventually lead us to something we can build on as we develop that kind of united vision. 
The fourth theme, perhaps more on the challenges side that we'll need to overcome, is the extent to which environment is prioritized in society generally and the challenge that comes with that for the ways that we engage with environmental science. So questions of profit and money and quality of living that often are prioritized above the level of environmental outcomes and needs and the challenges that come associated with trying to deal with those problems. Another challenge that we talked about in the group was an issue around confusion around the differences between environment and sustainability. And this maybe speaks a little bit into the question of are we environmental scientists or sustainability scientists? And it is in that context that we talked about not only the challenge that comes for potentially greenwashing where organizations might paint themselves as sustainable without taking environmentally positive outcomes, but also the ambiguity that comes with the general issue of something being sustainable, which perhaps could be perceived as being too broad a term, or perhaps could be something that is, is hard to nail down to specifics. And the other half of this conversation was the sixth thing that we discussed, which is moving on from the question of uh, environmental sustainability to the question of scientists. If the word science itself might be intimidating or alienating audiences who might otherwise engage in the question of environmental science or, or whatever you want to, to call it, and that perhaps we need to move to a place where we view our, all of ourselves more so as environmental scientists or scientists or engaging in science at the very least, that we might be people who are on the basis of information and data making decisions which are relevant to the future of the environment. And therefore, we might also consider the consequence of this lens of science as well as specifically this lens of environmentalism or sustainability. And it was in that context we talked about the benefit of uh, the IES being environmental sciences rather than scientists and the question that might have in terms of how it portrays that level of intimidation. And then the last thing that we entered on is about long term optimism and our ability to have some optimism for the future and how that develops. And the sense was that in the long term, if we can get a younger generation to engage more in these issues, we might have cause for quite a considerable degree of optimism. But in the short term, there are other things that need to be done to make environmental considerations, less of a bolt on to decisions, less of something that can be flagged up as greenwashing or anything else, and more of a consideration that runs through processes. And that's probably something that comes from professionals and sectors taking <laughs> environmental considerations much more seriously. Uh, so a very quick summary of what happened in our group. But uh, is there somebody from uh, Ethne, your group, who might be able to give a summary of what that breakout discussed? Okay, so we started off um thinking about uh, how things are changing, sorry, some things are changing already that bode well for the future. And I think w one of these is the fact that um, that many of these stronger, if you like, strict science disciplines have found that they're, that they're re reaching various limitations already with regards to how they approach solving real world problems. And for that, they've realized that the only way forward is to be an act a bit more interdisciplinary. I gave the example of, of things that Met Office are doing, for example, with regards to flooding and you know the fact that we know what's falling from the sky really isn't enough. We have to work with hydrogeologists, et cetera. Um, and um, I, I think that you know, bearing in mind what, what um, Gary was saying at the beginning about the need for us to understand how our environment is changing, it requires us, if you like, to perhaps monitor more and what then happens with the data. The data in the past was always kept in very siloed trenches and that doesn't do very much for giving us a better systems understanding of the environment and we would hope that going forward in the future that um, things like you know the very basic uh, 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 collection and uh, use of data should be more widely shared and that's what we would like to to push and hope for um again uh you know uh looking at how we monitor there was a, a cautionary note with regards to the the development and the fact that we have more um uh, uh cheap uh, sensors on the market. It, it could be that we're flooded really by a lot of very bad data. And I think that I'm hoping anyway, enough of us are aware of this and that we're able to do something about it. So I know there are various um, initiatives looking at how we can still use bad data or certainly recognize the extent in which the uncertainty stops us from doing anything proper uh, by way of using that data. So I think people have this, uh, are aware of this problem, but it is still a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, 
uh, I'd say also um, we were looking a little bit, talking a little bit about the sort of people who are getting involved in in um, environmental sciences, and it was <laughs> the point was quite nicely made that well we recognise it as a problem, we're we're trying to do something about it now, so only time will tell how successful we're going to be. But everybody here, certainly in the group, recognises the uh, the importance of having a diverse group of people involved in uh, in in the environmental sciences, but also by way of um, giving us a better chance of developing innovative solutions, I guess. Uh, I think there was also a few discussions around whether we need more research or whether it's more oh, that's around, right. we already know what we need to know. And I think there was a bit of discussion around, it depends on the area. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I don't know if you wanted to, to expand on yeah, that. Yeah, no, to, to, to a certain extent, you know, um, I, I have made the point that we we have collected a lot of data, but a lot of that data is just sitting gathering dust. And one wonders how much more we could do just if we had the chance to actually examine the data that we collectively all have. But then, you know, the question was then said that, you know, you know, well, do we actually still need to gather more evidence, more data, et cetera? And in some areas we certainly do. Uh, I remember looking back at the, uh, the, the, the problems associated with uh, nano uh, technology and having nanomaterials in the environment. The current way that we look at toxicology, for example, or it used to be, uh, uh, it was found that, that wasn't adequate enough to, to, to decipher what's actually going on in the environment with nano, nanotechnology and nanomaterials. So that required a fresh look, which I believe is still being worked upon. So yeah, much depended on, on which areas you were actually looking into, I think. Perfect, thank you, Noel. It sounds like you uh, also had a really interesting and fruitful discussion over in the other groups then. Well, now, now that we've had the chance to discuss, we'll be bringing the panel back in to answer your questions. Um, however, in the first instance, before we hop in, there are a couple of questions that came out of the breakouts that I think would be useful. And the first thing I'd like to do, uh, Naomi, is I'd like to come to you on, on the small statement you've put in the chat, because I think it's a very interesting and pertinent conversation. I wonder if you could maybe elaborate on this idea of being problem focused versus coming from specific disciplines, um, just to start us off on a panel discussion. So I have to be 100% honest here and say that that was me adding a little bit to our summary. I didn't actually um, raise this within our group, but many other people did. And I, I felt it was a, a really, really important um, element of our discussion around the fact that lots of the science and challenges that we're looking at, we can we do have these problems and we see, see sort of framed as very different problems. And we've got lots of people from different areas and we've talked a lot about the interdisciplinary um, and multidisciplinary situation that we find ourselves working in today and how working on problems rather than doing a specific thing within your own small area allows this kind of much broader um, work to be going on with the social sciences and natural sciences bringing lots of different perspectives um, into the sort of solution so there were colleagues in the room who who had some really great um contributions around this I just thought it was really something that we we should discuss it was really really interesting thank you for that Gary do you want to come in on this as well yeah thank you um yeah I think I, I mentioned it earlier in my uh, earlier interventions no I, I think this is this is this is a really strong uh, kind of shift in environmental sciences that I've seen over, over the years um and I think there is a kind of recognition that we do need to bring all these different uh, expertises together, different forms of knowledge, different sources of knowledge, it's not just academic knowledge as well, so practitioner knowledge and indigenous knowledge, etc. But I kind of made the point in our little breakout group, it was something that somebody said to me early on in my journey towards interdisciplinarity, that fundamentally interdisciplinarity does require strong disciplines. So we can't all be post-structuralist mush like me, is <laughs> how I've described. Um, but what that points to, though, is the need to make sure we are both nurturing those disciplines, but also nurturing the discipline of integration, of being the person that is there not to know everything about everything, but to understand how it all fits together, understand the bigger picture, be able to communicate that bigger picture, think much more systemically and enable that system, that, that systemic kind of approach and sense making to happen. So, um, so completely agree with this kind of shift that we need to continue to be much more problem focused we need to continue to to bring those different disciplines in but let's nurture that interdisciplinarity as much as we are the individual disciplines i think 
Great, thank you. And before we move on to the questions from the chat as those are coming in, I, the one that came out of our breakout discussion, it maybe follows from the idea of post-structuralist mush, um, was this idea of, uh, are we all scientists? Should we all be scientists? And so I suppose um, a question back to the panel would be, it would be interesting to get your perspectives on the question of, are we all scientists? And should we want to all be scientists? And I suppose, uh, John, you were coming from quite a technical perspective, uh, certainly not a perspective that everybody would have um, if we were considering everybody to be scientists. So I wonder if you have a position on this. Are we all scientists? Should we all be scientists? Yeah, I think it comes back uh, to basically the, the same as we were saying before. Uh, what question is it that you're trying to solve? Um, many of them will involve uh, a degree of science. Some may not. You need collaboration as always. Yeah, I mean, it just very much depends on, on, on the topic. There isn't one answer to it. It depends on... But I mean, coming back to thinking about this sort of... Um, Gary's comments about the um, journalism. Yes, no one can be um, an expert in all the areas, and and certainly within something like groundwater, which is a very diverse area, used to work with mathematicians, organic chemists, uh, inorganic chemists, uh, biochemists, um, and civil engineers. And I was the only geologist. It is necessary. Uh, it is important. But as you say, there is very much a role for the person who can see the, the bigger picture. I used to get very frustrated when I was young because I could see things that needed sorting out, but I didn't have the mathematical background or the chemical background to really sort it out. But as I've got, grown older, I've seen that I can see those problems, whereas those that had more specialist areas didn't. And it it so it works at a smaller scale as well as the big scale that you know, you, you, you're talking about. So in that sense, I, I sort of fully agree. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and uh, I think we've got a hand up from Noel Nelson, um, which we'll come to, and then we'll get into these questions in the chat about artificial intelligence. So Noel, what, what did you want to say? Yeah, just, just that, uh, it, you know, in my opinion, I think strict science only goes so far when it comes to solving problems. Um, you know, we, we can be very specialized and very specific about the things that science can do. But when it comes to applying what I consider to be environmental problems that includes humans, because we're all part of the environment as well, science can only go so far. And you know, to me, um, you know, this, again, I found this with the SPF work that I've been doing at the moment, uh, doing this strict science bit was hard, okay, but nowhere near as hard as bringing it all together and trying to work out how it's going to actually make a step change to what we're actually doing. And I think that's where the challenge really is, uh, but that's where the 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 the, um, the effectiveness of the science really is by bringing all the various disciplines together. Um, and I don't think, I'm not quite sure whether or not scientists are the best for doing that. Well, what we'll do is we'll bring in uh, Naomi and Gary to respond to the last couple of questions. Uh, so, Naomi, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to sort of say it depends how we define science and scientists <laughs> as to whether we are all scientists or not. So if we think about science as being learning about or experiencing or being in and observing the environment, then we are technically <laughs> non-technical scientists, um, I think, in my opinion. And, and I do a lot of work with uh, like environmental education and outdoor learning and forest school and getting people to experience being in the environment. And you see two to, two to four-year-olds observing, experimenting in being in the environment and starting their little science journey, really, um, and thinking about how we can, can maintain that as we go forward. So for me, I think we are all scientists in different ways um it's kind of where we go what we do with it people wouldn't necessarily want to be classed as scientists and, and the word science can be very off-putting to people um start thinking about the more technical aspects or being in laboratories or, or the maths and the numbers and that side of thing but in terms of understanding our environment and, and wanting to conserve our environment we're only going to want to conserve and preserve and work towards that if we spend some time observing and being in the environment. So it's a very long-winded way of saying, yes, I think we are all scientists, but it depends how we define science and scientist. I was going to say something very similar to what Naomi just said. Um, I used to work for Sir David King when he was the government chief scientific advisor, and he uh, would always use the word science uh, to mean knowledge or ways of knowing. And I think we can kind of 
see science as as Naomi kind of said it, it, it it's more of a way of thinking than it is the body of knowledge that it creates in that sense yeah. so yeah. being a scientist means that you are observing you are hypothesizing you're experimenting you're testing your critical thinking and it's that kind of way of being that perhaps is what we're thinking about rather than a being a scientist means you're in a laboratory staring down a microscope or taking water samples from a canal or something um but of course that's all part of it um so yeah um i think in that sense yes we all we all are and i come back to what i said earlier about um, amartya sen's kind of call for informed agitators so maybe maybe we should be <laughs> informed agitators and not and not just scientists in that sense. i like that Perfect, thank you. Um, so we'll come to the question in the chat next, as this question comes from uh, Julie asking, what role for artificial intelligence? Um, Julie says, analyzing data we haven't got around to, as Noel says, uh, may help with systems understanding. And Noel says, uh, I guess, with the quantity of new data that we could gather, AI would be the obvious way in dealing with this. So a couple of perspectives on artificial intelligence in there. What does, what does the panel think? Uh, John, uh, tell them you talked a little bit about AI in the context of groundwater and how that might develop in the future. Um, maybe you could start us off by elaborating a little bit on that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm no AI expert, um, but yeah, I mean, the opportunities for collecting very large quantities of data and at least sort of initial uh, first pass uh, identification, looking at quality, looking at um other links other structures within it is a sort of job for um ai type setups i feel that there's probably quite a lot of um role for it uh in two main areas in groundwater and the first one is in terms of sensor control um it, of of groundwater systems controlling them um under different circumstances in terms of responding uh, and the types of measurement that might be made with multi-parameter type jobs, and also with the interpretation um, of models, either initial pass interpretation as a point of developing some sort of concept or helping to develop some sort of conceptualization, but also in terms of further calibration and also in terms of real-time control of uh, systems like abstraction, groundwater abstraction, surface water abstraction systems. When do you take from one? When do you take from the other? Systems like the present, for example, in parts of Florida, where they're real time, just modeling and forecasting over the next two or three weeks and seeing which sources are appropriate. But combining a huge amount of data like demand data so on the sociological side but also biological data also chemical data and um, flow data as well so all of that uh, would be something that could be at least uh, gone through a sort of first pass uh, interpretation using sort of an artificial intelligence type tool i agree actually i think also with the um with, with uh, computers becoming ever more powerful as well. It gives us better capability with regards to doing a lot of this quite quickly, but also to have far more um, almost real-time reactive systems put in place yeah. if we treat things properly, you know. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for following that one up, uh, Noel. Does anybody have any final comments on AI before we move on? I'm going to read a quote, okay? And you have to tell me who it's from. <laughs> <laughs> From self-driving cars to medical breakthroughs, the potential of AI is immense. As we continue to explore this technology, we must also consider the potential ethical and societal implications. Yeah. But one thing is certain, AI is set to revolutionise the way we live, work and interact with the world around us. So the question is, who said that? Uh, maybe we'll have some guesses before I say what I suspect is the answer. <laughs> yeah, I think we might be all getting, getting better at guessing this, the answer to this these days. Go on then. Go on, you say. I suspect the answer is uh, Chat GPT. Maybe wrote that. Absolutely Gary. correct. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just to sort of finish off, uh, uh, I mean, my sense about AI, it's like many um, tools; they're only as good as the framing or the programming you give them. Um, and of course, 
the most useful science, and, and this is one of Gary's big themes, is, is the science that answers the questions we actually need answered, um, rather than it collects the data that's most easy to collect or um, addresses just one part of the system in isolation. So if we're going to use AI, I think we'll need to be clear that it, it we can help frame um, the way it operates quite carefully um and be duly possibly um sort of you know suspect about what it, it gives out rather than blindly accepting it so that would be my um my one thought on that thank you <clears throat> thank you uh, about uh, yes i mean the, the ai is as good as the algorithms behind it but uh also each professional is as good as their experience and training as well so yes be as skeptical of ai as you are of each other good point uh, i'd like to bring in naomi now as well because i don't think you maybe have a comment on ai as well just one well, i don't know anything about ai really but just a comment on an um, ethne's um contribution in the chat as well which is around the big data and thinking around sort of the use of it and thinking about the skills going forwards and, and within education and the focus on digital skills I, I don't think I I'd like to say that there won't be a focus as opposed to field work or lab skills. Um, I think they'll sort of it will be complementary. Um, I'd, I'd hate to think that environmental scientists of the future never leave the room that they're sat in whilst they're looking at computers and not yeah. learning about the environment or environments that they're they're looking at. So so I just wanted to to say that's really important and something we will need to be really cautious of as we move forward in in the education side of things, but making sure that we've still got that that doing which to me is a really important part of, of an environmental science education. Point. I suppose before we should, before we move on, we probably should continue talking a little bit more about this conversation of, of skills as, as it manifests in that question. Um, Gary, I think you were about to hop in, but I will just read out for everybody's sake the, the question that Ethne sent in the chat, which is, uh, I think the rise of big data and remote sensing also opens up some interesting thoughts on what skills will be needed by environmental scientists. Do you think there'll be a greater focus on data analysis and digital skills as opposed to field work and or lab skills? So Naomi, you're saying not as opposed to. Uh, Gary, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Naomi. I think uh, the, these are all very complementary. I think even a, a, a few years ago when um, environmental DNA uh, was first kind of being rolled out um, and Natural England was was kind of at the forefront of doing that for uh, licensing of um, great crested newts and all that kind of stuff there was a lot of concern amongst ecologists going oh we're all going to be out of job because you know we're, we're not going to be doing uh, field work anymore well that's nonsense because you still need the field work the field work is different uh, and it's differently purposed and it's much more about um kind of understanding the context and it's much more about validating the the, the information that's coming from these kind of big data sources of which eDNA generates ter terabytes of data every day Yes, you can use uh, AI to to help you analyze that, as, as as we've heard. But fundamentally, it has to be kind of humanized. It has to be kind of understood in context. It has to be understood in terms of the uncertainties, which is something that that Noel uh, talked about in our breakout group about really recognizing the the level of accuracy, level of uncertainty. Uh, really depends on the issue you're trying to address and how much wiggle room does that give you in your decision making. That's a human decision. Uh, so there will always be that. So um, my sense is that I don't think we're looking at data science uh, as replacing field work uh, at all. I just think it's going to be another tool in the toolkit. Um, yeah. And I just remember a few years ago saying to a soil scientist that that I had heard tell that the, the most sexy person on the planet in the future would be a numerate uh, data science enabled soil scientist. <laughs> <laughs> he got very excited by that idea. <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether whether we capitalised on it or not. But, uh, yeah, it was all about soil. It was all about data. Therefore, yeah. <laughs> For the time being, um, let's uh, move on to the question from John Baines in the chat, uh, who asks: Do the sciences need to recognise more the huge variety of aspirations in society they need to engage with? So, to an extent, picked up in both of the breakout discussions by the sound of it. Um, do we have any takes on that from Naomi, uh, Gary, or John? Yeah, Naomi, I'm assuming you are muting. Do you want to come in first? I'll just come in briefly. Um, 
just to say that we've, we've been doing some work um, looking at science capital and the di- sort of different dimensions of science capital. So thinking about whether how, how we make science relevant, people's experiences, their scientific literacy, sort of family science links, talking about science in everyday life and, and sort of thinking about different types of, of aspirations within society, but also how sort of within school level we can start thinking about science capital and sort of increasing sort of people's aspirations around science and their knowledge of science without necessarily becoming a scientist but thinking about the sort of social science media consumption within social media or on sort of old school media reading things watching things on tv thinking about transferability of science so in terms of aspirations i think we do need to recognize the aspirations but but we need to think about how we can raise aspirations and and encourage more people to be able to and be aware of of science within society so to sort of just bringing that science capital element into here that's something we've we've been looking at with with some of the outreach work we've been doing more recently thank you Uh, before we bring Noel into comment on this I think Gary you uh look like you were also raring to go so if you yes yes thank you yeah I'm going to take a slightly different tack on this hopefully John I haven't misinterpreted what you're saying so Behind people's aspirations, uh, I would argue, is a set of values um, that kind of help them kind of express those aspirations. What is it they think good looks like in that sense? Um, And in the environmental sciences, I don't think we've done anywhere near enough work in understanding the range of values that people have with regard to nature. Uh, This was underpinned last autumn by a report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services on values. Uh, and it highlighted uh, the enormous range of different value systems that people uh, have across the world in, rela- in, in thinking about the relationship between humans and the rest of nature. Uh, and they made very, very clear in that report that there was one frame of values that dominated above all others, and those were short-termist utilitarian values that said nature is there for us to exploit and do what we like with. And that had kind of dominated, uh, you know, post-war, mid-century kind of growth, uh, et cetera, which kind of has has really led to the Anthropocene uh, that we we find ourselves in. So I think that when we talk about the sciences needing to recognise, you know, that variety of aspirations, I think we're talking also about the social sciences and the arts and humanities in understanding how we can express those underpinning values that drive people's aspirations and engage with them in really positive and very pluralistic ways. So it's not about the sense of saying, we as a bunch of environmental scientists know what value system we should be operating in, and we're then going to drive everybody towards that. That would be undemocratic um, and um, unhuman in that sense. But I think we can do a lot more to recognise the range of values that underpin that and work much more explicitly with it, which is kind of underpins the point I made in my initial uh, introductory comments about having decide, having spotted all this change, we need to decide whether it matters and for whom does it matter and why does it matter? Because otherwise we're kind of doing what David Hume uh, advised us not to do back in the 1600s when he said, we're, con- we're confusing is with ought. And science is very good at describing how things are and how things might be and how things were, but it really doesn't have any privilege in telling, in telling us how things should be. Um, and I think we need to be careful of that, but we can illuminate that question through scientific approaches to revealing and understanding that that range of values within the system. Yeah, uh, I think this is quite a complicated area, actually, because I think science, technology, politics, the whole thing um, doesn't do enough uh, development of what they want to do from the bottom up. Uh, you know, people are always saying that, you know, why are they, you know, uh, inventing this particular widget. I don't particularly have no use for it. And, and I think there's not enough connection between, you know, general people and their aspirations, but right across the board. But I don't think it's something that's easy to do. I also think that um, I, 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 I berate the, the, the demise, if you like, in the respect that science and maths have in the in the general public. I mean, people now... Uh, saying, you know, a certain badge of pride, and this goes right the way up to political levels, actually, Um, people saying, oh, yeah, I don't do maths, you know, and I kind of think, well, yeah, there used to be a time when the, you know, the so-called educated person 
could, was at home and speaking and talking to you about and appreciating the arts as they were the sciences. And we seem to have gone the other way now. The sciences massively be left out. But I think in order to do right by society, I think it'd be good if we can help encourage this more general understanding of the full spectrum of what we try to teach at schools, I think. Um, but I think we don't do it so well, I don't think, especially earlier on, I think. And some people get away, supposedly get away without understanding some of the rudiments of yeah. science, which are quite important, I think. I just, I, I just agree. I think, yeah, that's all very sensible. <laughs> yeah, within, within reason, as long as we're not trying to teach everybody yeah, within reason. Maths. Yeah. I don't yeah. think we need that. I think we need to make yeah. it functional. We need to make it relevant. Yeah. Um, I've often thought, for instance, waving a mobile phone around in front of a class of kids and saying, right, let's talk about this. It would be a brilliant thing to do. It would be a fantastic mm. lesson. Because, you know, we've but, got them, you know, uh, and, let's, uh, and let's explore it from, from what's, what's relevant to them. Yeah. I, at the time when people were getting sick of the word climate change, I remember speaking to people in my locality about, you know, because I live in Egham, we had like two floods in three years. So talking about what was going on with floods was quite an interesting way in to talking about what was going on with the climate. And I never mentioned the yeah. word climate once. No, no, exactly. You know, exactly. and people yeah. can, uh, you know, I think Naomi says, you know, people are very good at observing change going on around them. They don't necessarily have explanations for it, but they observe and they question. And I, you, you can sort of hook in on that angle quite often. Yeah. So I didn't have to get technical at all. We just talked about exactly. what was going on. Exactly. You know? We, we uh, in, in Natural England at the moment, we're having this debate about rolling out increasing capability around systems thinking. Uh, and we're doing it using what we refer to as the fight club metaphor, which is the first rule of systems thinking is don't mention systems thinking and talk about... <laughs> talk about you know difficult messy complex problems that people face and you know yeah. various ways and tools that we can address them without having to kind of lead with the jargon that we as the so-called scientists and the experts you know all very familiar with but talk about stuff in terms that matters to the people that we're trying to engage with mm. um, and not bring not force them to come into our in, into our camp Perfect. Thank you. We're very stretched for time, so I think we're going to have to uh, wrap up the Q&A there with maybe some closing comments from each of the panellists. So we'll go back down in the reverse order to how they presented to us. So John Tellum, then Naomi Holmes, and then Gary Cass. And what we'll ask for is just a sentence or two, your summary about what we should expect for the future of environmental sciences, or indeed, whatever you want to call them. So John, do you want to start us off with just a final closing statement from you? Just refer to my last slide, I suppose. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think integration is absolutely vital. And I think a lot of the future is going to be controlled, um, hopefully, if finance stands up by um, a lot of the new technological advances that are, that are coming through. Uh, I'm very used to thinking about subjects from problems as opposed to anything else so uh, i've not sort of come across it as approaching it from other areas really so i fully agree with um using problem-led approaches and interdisciplinary ones as well thank you john naomi what's your final takeaway uh, just that well, I've really enjoyed having this conversation between people from so many different areas uh, within the environmental sciences and, and if we're thinking about going forwards we need to be doing this as much as we can and, and getting all that input um talk about the environmental education being as i said on that last again going back to my last slide john i was going to do the same going back to it being fundamental to achieving sort of transformation to our, our current range of global sustainability challenges and and getting as many people engaged and involved in all different ways not purely as specific scientists but um through just engagement with the environment and with communities um just really exciting time really as, as we sort of look forward with all this thank you Naomi and then the final word uh, from the panel goes to you Gary what's your final takeaway from, from today's discussion fantastic it, it's been an absolute um, pleasure and um, really enjoyed the conversation hugely rich um what I would say is it kind of comes back to this kind of focus around thinking about the future of environmental sciences in at least three kind of ways that Joseph will be familiar with, and it's similar to the way that we're trying to approach some work within Natural England at the moment. And that's to think about the what of environmental science, you know, the, the topics that we want to think about and the, the kind of um, uh, 
you know, actual focal points. The how, which is about how do we go about doing it, the role of uh, technologies, the role of partnership working, the role of citizens, uh, and that leads you into the who. And we had very, very clear uh, expression earlier about the importance of a focus on the who, who is it, where are they coming from, what diversity uh, of, of views and perspectives and backgrounds they bring with that and, and really kind of bring bring that together. Um, so I think there's there's huge, huge value in this conversation and I look forward to the rest of the future of ES23 uh, over the coming months. Thank you. No, and thank uh, all of you for those those closing uh, remarks. I'm afraid that it is all we have time for, but thank you for all of the questions from the discussion and all of the responses mm -hmm. from the panelists and comments from the audience. Thank you again to all of you for attending, for participating and sharing your views and questions. Thank you especially to, to Gary, Naomi and John for setting us up so well and sharing your expertise and for such a, a great panel discussion at the end there. Uh, everything we've discussed today will help to inform our work throughout the year as we produce our vision statement for the future of the environmental sciences. If you'd like to be involved in those discussions, please get in touch and we can discuss how best to work together or to integrate your perspective. Um, so next week, we'll be shifting our focus to that question of the regulatory landscape, where we'll be looking at the regulations and rules which govern the environment, regulate the profession and control funding for research and development. For now, that's it from us today. So thank you to everyone for logging in and participating. I hope you found that beneficial and informative. Don't forget to record your attendance at this webinar on our CPD tool if you're an IES member by logging into the IES members area. Uh, please subscribe to our channel, like the video and share it with your friends and colleagues. Join the conversation so we can get your perspectives in as well. If you've enjoyed today's webinar, please do consider joining the IES as a member. But for now, thank you again to Gary, to Naomi and John. And thank you to everybody for attending and to taking part in the conversation. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you and uh, goodbye. <laughs>